But now it's my great uh, pleasure and privilege to welcome a very preeminent name uh, uh, in cardiology, Dr. Sharon Hayes. Sharon, welcome. So nice Hi. to have you. Thank you so much. And um, at, at least part of this delay is on me, I will say. Um, so apologies for that. So unfortunately, the Mayo IT couldn't get me into your Zoom. So I am on phone and I'm going to have folks um, advance my slides. I'm excited to talk about SCAD or spontaneous coronary artery dissection. And when um, I was asked to speak on it, um, we talked about some of the things that overlap it in terms of this condition and some of the misperceptions and perhaps some of the biases that kept us from knowing about this condition for a long time. Sharon, thank you so much for, um, you know, just uh, improvising in the very last minute. This speaks <laughs> off to your um, uh, to your resilience and, and particularly uh, we know now with all of our pandemic and all the pursuits for CME, we always try and uh, stay resilient. But uh, to all of you, I think Sharon Hayes is a big name in cardiology. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce her. Dr. Hayes um, uh, received a medical degree from Northwestern University and then pursued her fellowship in internal medicine and cardiovascular diseases at Mayo Clinic, Rochester, and subsequently joined us, the staff there. She's currently the professor of cardiovascular medicine and has founded and maintains an active presence in the national scene in women's uh, heart disease. And she runs the Women's Heart Clinic at Mayo Clinic Rochester, uh, which she serves as also the chair um, uh, for the academic, while also serving as the chair for the academic uh, affairs and the faculty development program uh, in the Department of uh, Cardiovascular Medicine. Um, Dr. Hayes has been a strong advocate for women's health and she has uh, served as Mayo Clinic's first director of diversity uh, and inclusive um, um, behaviors uh, from 2010 to 2020. Uh, she has set up a very high bar in her leadership, particularly uh, while maintaining and developing solutions for equity in patient care and workforce development. Uh, under her leadership, Mayo Clinic was nationally recognized for the accomplishments and she has also directed the Mayo Clinic's Office of Women's Health and has led multiple such efforts throughout the health system uh, where she continues to work as a very in a very preeminent uh, position. Dr. Hayes uh, is a member of various uh, national uh, initiatives and, and she has served in multiple uh, society initiatives. Uh, I had a privilege of working with her on a couple of such uh, uh, societies, particularly uh, the current uh, uh, do latest document uh, on building inclusiveness and, uh, and, and diversity at uh, ACC. I had a chance to work with her and I can tell, tell you that she's a vehement proponent and, and a strong force to reckon with, particularly when it comes to uh, collegiality, diversity, and also um, the thoughtfulness that she brings to any of the documents. So I've really enjoyed being in these roles. Uh, it will be important for me to recognize that her commitment to women's heart health has been recognized uh, by the 2002 uh, Wegener's Award, uh, an invitation from First Lady uh, Laura Bush to speak at the White House for the first National Viewer Day in 2004, the Women's Day Magazine Best uh, Dress Award, in 2009, and the 2022 Dr. Carol McHugh Award for Women's Cardiologist of the Year. Dr. Hayes is nationally recognized educator and speaker on the topics that we just spoke about. In fact, if someone really wants to pursue a career in women's health, and particularly for colleagues, um, uh, my colleagues uh, who, uh, my female colleagues who are interested, uh, particularly fellows and young faculty, she will be the person and perfect um, uh, icon and a role model to uh, emulate. So with that, uh, Sharon, I welcome you. And I'm also very interested to introduce you uh, two important names from our own uh, health uh, care and health system. Uh, one of them happens to be a very close friend, uh, Dr. Rachna Kulkarni. Rachna and myself, uh, we have our uh, belongings back to my hometown, Nagpur. We are graduates from Government Medical College, uh, Nagpur. So welcome, Rachna. Uh, so nice to have you. And she has been a force to reckon with. She's the president and managing partner of medical, uh, medical uh, cardiology and board of trustees of Akshay Patra USA. 
she has numerous, numerous uh, leadership position. And I can tell you, I can spend about the next 10 minutes telling you all about her. And I'm sure that we need to really quickly catch on to the talk. But I can tell you uh, that uh, she has been at multiple uh, institutions, AHA, uh, American Heart, uh, uh, serving as a cardiologist expert on Horizon BCBS and PNT committee. She's been um, a, a executive role, played executive role at Robert Wood Johnson Medi uh, Un University Hospital, Somerset. Uh, and, and currently, in fact, um, uh, she uh, is uh, uh, planning on making a major impact uh, she has been just recently inducted uh, uh, into the health system at Somerset, uh, and she's going to be leading the Women Health Program uh, as the director of the Women Health Program. So we are really looking forward to um, doing some creative steps and working uh, collaboratively uh, together. So welcome. I was a little brief, Rachna, on your introduction. I could probably go on more, but uh, this you. is a treat to have you here. I'm also going to introduce another person, and re really this completes the circle. So uh, Dr. Delphine Tang. Dr. Delphine Tang is our own graduate. She completed her interventional cardiology fellowship uh, and uh, in 2020 and presently is working uh, as an interventional cardiologist, cardiologist as in Cardiology Associates of New Brunswick and is actively participating in the interventional cardiology program here. And we all uh, enjoy uh, whenever she's uh, uh, involved in the procedures and, and, and really Delphine, it's, it's, uh, it's a wonderful to have you here. So what we will do is have Sharon give her talk and, and then we'll bring you back and then we'll have some active discussion on where the field needs to be, what we need to do in New Jersey and so on and so forth. Sharon, now the stage is yours. Well, thank you very much. And are my slides up? I am not seeing them. They will come up momentarily. Okay. All right. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much. Um, and again, I am honored to be in such great company. And Partho, the feeling is mutual. So next slide. So I have no um, financial uh, or other conflicts of interest, although I will say I am not an interventional cardiologist, and we'll start with that. Next slide. So we're going to talk today about spontaneous coronary artery dissection, and I'm going to talk about a condition that was first described back in 1931 um, by a Dr. Petty, Pretty, um, but that has subsequently um, sort of fell out of understanding um, for us in that at least what I learned in cardiology school, next slide, um, was that this was extremely rare. I might see one or two cases in my career that it was 70% women, so different, um, but still a lot of men, and that two thirds of the women were peripartum. I want you to remember those because we'll talk about what we know now. Most of the literature, if you go back, is case reports and autopsy series. And survival of SCAD or spontaneous coronary artery dissection was actually reportable. And if you talk to patients who had SCAD before 2010 or so, some of them said, I looked it up and I stopped because I realized I must be the only one who survived. There were multiple associations and causes, most of which were one-offs in single case reports, lots of best treatments, one of the challenges in we, when we look back is that there were inconsistent and multiple SCAD definitions. And some of them included atherosclerotic or traumatic, so not spontaneous. And there were some early reports of triggers and spontaneous healing. Next slide. So I did bring, want to bring this up because it's a little bit on that theme of lack of recognition as well as dating itself. So this is from the early 1990s, a case report of a young housewife who developed SCAD after unusually severe exercise um, because she went to the gymnasium to work out. And it says that this rare diagnosis must be considered when young women present with acute myocardial infarction. Next slide. So flash forward a few years. Now I will say I founded our Women's Heart Clinic in 1998 and so felt I was somewhat of an expert on heart disease in women. And at the time that in 2009, two women came forward to me at a, at a training program for women with heart disease. And they said, you know, Dr. Hayes, 
what's Mayo Clinic doing to study SCAD? And I kind of puffed up and said, well, not even a Mayo Clinic could study SCAD because it's just so rare. Well, these two women had come together on an, uh, an online platform, uh, a community for heart disease in women, and they had collected over 70 women with um, SCAD. And I, that got my, me scratching my head and saying, well, it can't be that rare. And they'd actually come up with um, a, 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 a research proposal or at least some questions. So from there, we developed our current registry and I'm gonna report reg um, information from both what we found, but also I would like to share what some of the other great work that's being done internationally on SCAD. So we felt it was, we as an international group did feel like it was a great, um, uh, next slide, um, a, a great, uh, it's a great thing when you get a scientific statement in the American Heart Association, and I prefer that because it still is, is largely unoutdated. Next slide. And then we followed up with a Jack State of the Art review. So we went from in 2010 to thinking no one could study this to at least having some data and lots of interest. Next slide. So what do we know now in, um, in 2022? So one, the demographics, the average age, very different from uh, atherosclerotic MI, 42 to 53, depending on the series, but there have been teenagers and individuals up into their 80s who clearly had what we would consider SCAD and not um, an atherosclerotic dissection. It is more like 90% women and only about 5 to 15% are pregnancy associated or peripartum. Remember, it was 70% before. And I think those were, it was because we were missing all the rest of them. Cardiovascular risk factors are uncommon. They're about what we see in the general population, but they are not absent. I think that's important. And we'll talk about that. And the other thing that SCAD is not rare. It's uncommon, yes, but we were missing it. First of all, what I was taught in cardiology school was that I looked for the entomal flap. I looked for that double lumen. We now know that most SCAD presents with intramural hematoma. So that 70% or so we were missing. This occurs in about one to 4% of all MI patients. And it's the number one cause of pregnancy associated myocardial infarction. And it is the number one cause of myocardial infarction in women under 40 and probably under the age of 50. I think the other thing that we need to talk about is why we might ha not have been um, looking at this and studying this is biases about heart disease in the patient population. Next slide. So one of the things that um, we've known for, for a number of years and been the source of a lot of my work and others trying to bring forward and catch up the science of heart disease in women, which is not the same disease in many cases, whether it's HEFPAF being more common in women or SCAD or Minoka. And this was a case, actually a, a, a story that I'm not gonna go into, but it really was two sisters who had SCAD within two weeks of each other. The first one actually had SCAD treated and a relatively urban center had appropriate care, got taken to the hospital, admitted. The second one went to a hospital that was more rural um, but not rural. She's for, she was 42. She really didn't have a lot of risk factors. She was anxious though. And she basically had elevated troponins and was sent home and see, saw three other healthcare providers before five days later being diagnosed with her SCAD at th that point with a um, ejection fraction of 40%. So we are still missing these folks because of uh, that healthy, thin, 30 or 40 year old coming in who hadn't just had a baby. So I, I, I think that's an important point as we go forward. Next slide. I think the other thing is to remember that these patients present like any other heart attack, except the person is different. And if we keep that in mind, so somebody, this was a survey of presenting symptoms of our database and they, we have a detailed questionnaire and over 80% had some type of chest pain, nausea and vomiting was in a quarter, they were short of breath and sweating. Um, so these are folks who are presenting like any other acute coronary syndrome. I think it's really important that 20% have a normal troponin and the first troponin. So this really is one, a group that we could miss because some of the newer algorithms are saying, 
young, otherwise healthy, first troponin negative, we can dismiss them from the ED. So I think we need to put a little bit of a red flag on that. Next slide. So we've been missing SCAD and intramural hematoma because of this low index of suspicion. They're young, they're female, they don't have plaque anywhere. Click. We also get, we may take them to the cath lab because they, this is another place that we can miss them because they've had a, that they've had an NSTEMI. We take them to the cath lab and we either cause we either miss it altogether or we call that minor irregularity, um, spasm or normal coronaries, or we see the wall motion and call it Takotsubo. And I would make the, the point that making the diagnosis is critically important for us to do because it makes a difference in the short term, like acutely, as well as long term. Next slide. What we also now know is SCAD is not benign. It presents with STEMI about 50% of the time and DTVF and, 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 and over 10% and multi-vessel SCAD in 20 to 25%. We also know, and we'll go into it a little more deeply about traditional or recommended acute coronary syndrome treatments like PCI may cause harm. We know that there are, is a significant recurrence rate and significant post-SCAD morbidity in MACE. The other good news, it was this, unlike atherosclerotic myocardial infarction, it often heals without treatment or intervention in 60 to up to 100%, depending on the series. And so <clears throat> knowing that um, can also help us manage the patients. Next slide. So we've also grown in our knowledge over the past decade of some of the, in, uh, the conditions that are associated with SCAD. So I keep changing the size of this, this, the bubbles in this Venn diagram based on kind of the relative and I, uh, the relative frequency. We know that pregnancy and hormonal conditions, um, particularly pregnancy, and it's associated with hypertension, possibly preeclampsia and gestational diabetes. There seems to be uh, an association with infertility, not necessarily infertility treatment and migraines. Um, the inherited arteriopathies should be a very tiny bubble because um, as we'll talk about, that makes up less than 4%, at least of the ones we can identify. We'll talk a bit more at the end about some of these newer uh, susceptibility genes, but fibromuscular dysplasia and other systemic um, type um, uh, arteriopathies has really come to play in the forefront. Uh, click please. Yeah. And then you combine with this with perhaps a vulnerable patient with one or more of these um, conditions, and then often, but not always a trigger, whether it's sex hormones in the pregnancy, intense exertion or Valsalva, emotional stress, generally severe stress, sheer stress, perhaps hypertension. So um, it, it often is sort of the perfect storm. Um, I will say that among those who have a trigger, only about 25% report one. And so I think that a lot of times we're looking for something um, and, and we don't need to look too far because of recall bias. Next slide. Uh, the other uh, part of this is, um, as you can see, this cartoon, which I often share with patients to help them understand why perhaps their SCAD was not initially recognized, but the importance of diagnosing and recognizing intramural hematoma um, uh, is really important because that is the dominant uh, way that SCAD presents angiographically. Next slide. So here, just for those of you who are um, perhaps not look, used to looking at angiograms all the time, on the left, you see a medial or intramural hematoma. It looks like a, it, it's basically, you look at it and you see that the artery temporarily narrows, but in kind of a smooth fashion and then gets bigger again versus the flap on the right side. Next slide. Um, it can be very helpful to use intravascular uh, um, imaging, either uh, IVUS or OCT, because that has really helped us characterize. I will say this now, and again, you do not need to use this. Um, once you learn the patterns uh, that you're looking for, we only now use OCT or IVUS in those for which we cannot um, make the diagnosis that we're still unsure. Um, I, I want to make you aware of some of these types. These were um, uh, pulled together um, as a way to help those of us in the cath lab um, 
use pattern recognition. So that type one is the typical tear that we learned about. And then type two and type three are both intramural hematoma. It's just the type three mimics atherosclerosis a bit more. Um, I think it's better rather than the to use the word types or the types is to talk about the tear versus intramural hematoma. And I will share with you after that, after in, in a later slide, why that physiology is important for early prognosis. Next slide. And that was the slide I was just talking about, sorry. So I'll give you a little time. This is the, the intimal tear um, on the left and then intramural hematoma is both types one and two. Next slide. So you've got a patient who comes in, they're having an acute coronary syndrome. So that's the clinical presentation. You have to have that index of suspicion, um, even if it is a young woman and then perform coronary angiography. That really is the gold standard. Um, we can talk a little bit during the Q&A if you'd like about um, the role of coronary CT angiogram, but it really isn't sufficient um, to rule out, certainly to rule out. Next slide. So, the, oh, no, just click, go back, thanks. So we do coronary angiography and it's very important to use intracoronary nitroglycerin. Um, this is so you can eliminate spasm as the diagnosis. And then you're going to look for intramural hematoma or an intimal flap or tear or some other confirmed diagnosis. So if you cannot make the diagnosis based on standard um, coronary angiography, um, if you're not sure, consider OCT or IVIS if it's safe and feasible. Sometimes it can be very helpful to do coronary CTA afterwards. So we can sometimes see that intramural hematoma, um, but also remember if this heals, we could look at an early coronary CT angiogram and look at the same area four to eight weeks later or repeating a coronary angiogram. Now we're often faced, because I see a lot of these folks in clinic, and so I have no opportunity to redo anything else at the time of cath lab. And I've got an angiogram I've been asked to comment on that's ambiguous. It could be SCAD, but it could be something else. So sometimes you start putting together the evidence, for instance, if they also have fibromuscular dysplasia or have had other, um, uh, other diagnoses. But I think it's important to try to make that diagnosis best you can because it does make a difference. Next slide. Some other things to look at in the cath lab are that these individuals with SCAD, about 70% of them have tortuosity compared to age and gender match control angiograms where it's about 30%. So this is not unique to SCAD, but looking for the curly cues or even uh, the lumpy bumpy coronary FMD, which may or may not be coronary FMD, um, there's some debate there, but looking for extra signs if you, again, are unsure. This is tough and the more angiogram, next slide. The more angiograms we look at, um, I think the more times we say, yeah, could be SCAD, probably SCAD, but maybe need a little something else. So some of the things that get us tripped up are, are distal total occlusions where there's just a missing vessel. And because SCAD often affects smaller vessels, um, we may not see it. Pseudo dissections due to contrast, uh, contrast streaming or where the ventricle looks Takasubo-like. And so we look at that and we don't look real hard to see that's actually um, a, a distal LAD SCAD or even multivessel SCAD that is causing that uh, rather than Takatsubo. Next slide. So here's a case. So this was a patient who presented with an n STEMI and had an angiogram that was reviewed a couple of times by different, uh, and they said, we just don't see where this is. It's a normal angiogram. Next slide. Um, but because of the troponin elevation, they did an MRI and, uh, were, and saw gadolinium enhancement consistent with an infralateral uh, wall infarction. Um, and uh, so uh, went back and did an angiogram. It was a few weeks later. And what you can see, that's the first angiogram on the left and the second angiogram where we've got a new vessel. Thank you for advancing, since I didn't say, um, where we've got a new vessel that has come. So this was a SCAD that was actually diagnosed kind of retrospectively. Next slide. So in this um, particular case, um, the initial thought was this is a SCAD, this is intramural hematoma. But importantly, this was an individual who had pseudo SCAD or spasm. And so once nitroglycerin was given, that plumped up. Um, uh, next. 
but this patient actually did have SCAD as a cause of their, um, uh, of their infarct. It was just in a different vessel, more distal, and um, we, it, we would have missed it if we sort of focused only on the pseudospasm. Next slide. So in this article um, uh, that was led by my colleague at Leicester, England by David Adlam, uh, we put together a few things to help with those ambiguous cases, looking at that middle group, the SCAD mimickers, but if it's less, it's less likely to be SCAD if it's a non-acute presentation. Again, these are typically uh, acute coronary syndrome males because they make up only about 10%. Extremes of age, look real carefully at the very young or old um, or the presence of thrombus. So thrombus is very uncommon uh, angiographically uh, in SCAD and in favor are obviously pregnancy associated, not responsive to intercoronary nitrates or interval complete healing. Next slide. Yes, SCAD is bad. Next slide. Um, so one of the um, one of the things we that many of you know is that in general we try to avoid intervening in SCAD even when the artery looks kind of rough, and this um, demonstration is is kind of one of the reasons. And for any of you who have watched the angiogram unravel um, in uh, a SCAD patient in the cath lab, you'll see. So on the on the A panel, you'll see a SCAD. It's kind of rough looking vessel, but there's decent flow. But they decide to make it uh, to open it up, put a um, put a stent in, and what you see is that it has pushed that intramural hematoma proximally, and now there's that little beak of a, a lumen, put another stent in, and basically after the third stent, we've got um, SCAD that is affecting the left main and about to go down to the, um, to the circumflex. Uh, next slide. So the initial acute management, you've heard, we try to uh, manage conservatively because there is a 30 to 40% complication rate or non-success um, non rate for this. So some of the ways to help you decide on what to do is, is it a high risk anatomy? And high risk anatomy is somebody who has, um, uh, has either proximal two vessel disease or left main disease. And then we look about, are they stable or not? And is there an extension risk? So the goal really is to restore flow it is not to seal the dissection. And so for those with no high-risk anatomy who are stable, we recommend conservative management and stay in the hospital for three to five days. Those who are clinically stable with left main or severe proximal two vessel disease, consider cabbage. There's good outcomes from that. Um, there are downsides for cabbage. Conservative therapy may be reasonable. It hasn't been studied well. But if they have active or ongoing ischemia, and I'm gonna make a point here, or hemodynamic instability, you really should consider PCI or urgent cabbage. And I say this, um, it needs to be emphasized, is there has been a pendulum swing. We've heard about how maybe we shouldn't um, intervene on these folks. And so often we see the, um, people with chest pain on a nitro drip for days in the hospital, really unstable, and we really need to take it forward. Next slide. And this study I think was very helpful. It was with one of the European um, uh, uh, registries. And these were, they, they did a case control match of over 200 PCI versus conservatively um, treated and looked at, okay, why, why did we intervene and what was the uh, success rate? <clears throat> the vast majority of the, the proceeding to intervention was failing conservative management. So chest pain five days later, zero flow, STEMI or VF. So over 80% improved flow, there were, yes, about 40% complications, 13% of were severe. And in these folks, there were more stents, the stent length was longer, but generally they had good long-term outcomes. So I would make the point is if you have a high-risk patient, don't um, sit around waiting for them to, to extend their infarct. It may be time to revascularize either with PCI or cabbage. So what about after the angiogram? Um, we generally hold anticoagulants. Um, obviously, if you don't know that it's gonna be a SCAD, you're gonna put them on heparin, but um, we, we generally don't put them on dual antiplatelet therapy early unless they have PCI and hold the heparin and others. 
beta blocker and aspirin early, manage symptoms. A lot of them will have some residual chest pain. For those who are conservatively managed, who don't get PCI, there is a dissection extension risk that depending on the study is anywhere from two to 10% in that first week. And so, and those who have an intramural hematoma, and you can see on the cartoon diagram on the, um, I'm sorry, next slide, please. Um, so you can see on that cartoon diagram on, uh, on the right. So if you have an intramural hematoma, you could have more bleeding into the intramural hematoma, which could occlude the vessel and cause extension. So going back up into the more proximal or distal, it can tear and decompress. And so in general, for those individuals who are conservatively managed, we keep them in the hospital and observe them for three to five days. Um, we try to avoid going back in unless we have to because iatrogenic dissections are pretty common. I'm going to quote in these next few slides um, some really recent data from the CANSCAD um, database. This was a randomized pro uh, prospective trial looking, um, well, it wasn't randomized, but it was a prospective trial uh, with an average uh, follow-up of two and a half years done uh, at a number of centers in Canada. And um, uh, and I think that has a study which was presented at AHA and just published in the past couple of weeks has been, um, has been very helpful. So next slide. So early therapy after SCAD, ne um, next slide. So beta blockers, yes. Um, they have been associated with lower recurrence. Um, uh, and so I try to try them for at least a year. They are sometimes poorly tolerated particularly among young individuals and folks who have low blood pressure, treat elevated blood pressure. So the rate uh, in virtually every registry, the rate in, uh, of hypertension in SCAD is about a 25%. So it is not rare. And so really trying to get that blood pressure normal or low. Um, we do not use statins, not routinely. They, we reserve those for for primary prevention of uh, atherosclerosis. They don't have any effect on SCAD recurrence. Um, treat, use other meds as per non-SCAD indications, heart failure, PCI, depression, angina. And then um, of, we usually stop oral contraceptives, hormone therapy, any exogenous hormones, and tryptans. We ask that they stop because of the vasoconstrictor. And this becomes a problem too, because we have a high proportion of individuals who have migraines, and often it is the tryptans that have been their lifesaver. Fortunately, there are some other good migraine medications um, that uh, appear safe and SCAD. So next slide. So early antiplatelet therapy after SCAD, particularly for that conservatively managed. Remember, we're going to put the PCI in STAP. So why don't we use DAP? What are the, what are the um, advantages of that? Well, it's standard for acute coronary syndrome. We do sometimes see microvascular um, uh, obstruction on MRI, but there is an increased risk of MACE. And there've been several studies that have suggested, including our registry, where the extension risk was higher in those who had, um, who had intramural hematoma and a large, um, go back. Thanks, I'm not done with this slide quite. Um, and, a, and a large study that came out of Spain that looked at those aspirin versus DAPT, again, observational and found a higher rate. And there is an argument to be made for no antiplatelet therapy because, as we mentioned, intraluminal um, uh, hematoma is, um, is common and luminal thrombus is rare. So the consensus is really lacking here, um, but uh, I typically use aspirin alone for 30 days or continue it. Um, uh, I don't use nothing currently. I also don't use dual antiplatelet therapy. Um, I tend to reserve DAP for definite thrombus. And I think that that is um, clearly uh, something that we're, uh, we're still need some data. There is currently a randomized controlled trial in Europe looking at beta blocker um, versus no and um, DAP versus aspirin. Next slide. So in terms of early um, and mid-range outcomes, um, those Individuals who are more likely to have early problems, as we've mentioned, intramural hematoma, so that type two or three, proximal vessel involvement, those who received DAPT at discharge, and those who have pregnancy-associated SCAD. In terms of late um, complications, those with uh, pregnancy-associated SCAD and possibly fibromuscular dysplasia, only shown in one, well, two studies now, both observational. 
as we indicated, dissection healing is common, commonly within a few days, and survival is excellent, better than atherosclerotic acute coronary syndrome, um, and it, uh, upwards of 95% at 10 years. Uh, next slide. So let's talk about recurrence. Patients don't want to. Uh, we don't have to. We don't like to face them. And I can tell you, prior to you know this burst of um, of knowledge about SCAD, patients were told either you're lucky to be alive. This is a lightning strike. It will never happen again. Or they were told you can't do anything. You just need to sit around. You're about to have another heart attack anyway. Now, prior to the CAN SCAD data, virtually every registry who had looked at recurrence rates had found a rate of about two to 3% per year um, of recurrent SCAD. And that's the Mayo group, the European group, and actually the Vancouver group um, previously. The um, CAN-SCAD, again, it's a three-year, so shorter follow-up. They found a total recurrent MI of about 10%. So that kind of fits with it, but a SCAD recurrence rate of much lower. And they included the extensions. Um, I worry a little bit about getting overly excited about this lower rate of recurrence simply because we have had SCAD re, uh, recurrence out 12, 15 years. So it doesn't appear to be something that you're at risk only for a, a short period of time afterwards and then not at risk. But I think one of the, the things that the authors and, and the investigators of CANSCAD is a very, very high percentage of their patients had were, were taking beta blockers. Recurrent SCAD typically occurs in a different vessel and I do have a patient who's had about six or seven SCADs. That's very, very rare, but some will have three or four. And I think it's important, another reason not to do PCI or cabbage is that does not provide any protection from recurrent SCAD or um, revascularization in the future. Next. So chest pain after SCAD, any of you who are caring for SCAD patients, um, you are seeing them with chest pain. It's anywhere from 30 to 70% more so among women. It's very scary. So they run to the ED a lot. Um, lots of inpatient chest pain evaluations. And I think it's important that um, one, all of this chest pain is not ischemia. Some of it's clearly chest wall pain, non-cardiac. Some might be restenosis of stents or stent issues. And obviously some may be new or recurrent SCAD. Commonly, and this is something that we've observed is that many of these people will have nitrate responsive chest discomfort. However, they will pass a stress test with flying colors. So there's a suspicion that this might be either spasm or, um, or microvascular dysfunction. I think it's important that we don't tell these patients that it's, uh, 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 that it's normal to have chest pain afterwards. It's not normal, it's common. And, uh, and then to evaluate it appropriately. I think the other point is a number of, um, reproductive age women will report menstrual cycle variation in their angina. It's actually pretty common. And they'll often say, I do fine until the day or two days before my period, and I'll have more chest pain, I'll pop, be popping nitro, and then I move forward. So an approach to these folks is avoid a cath if non-invasive will do because of the iatrogenic dissection risk. Stress testing can be helpful, particularly if we wanna exclude something we wanna do a cath for, um, or revascularize, or they have exertional symptoms. And coronary CTA can be very helpful to assess the proximal coronaries. And I use it not because I'm gonna detect every small vessel, but because that will get me an out from perhaps doing a cath. Um, the poor man's diagnostic test is to give them sublingual nitroglycerin and ask them if that relieves their chest pain. And if it does on a consistent basis, I'll put them on long acting nitrates. And then obviously doing a coronary angiogram um, if necessary and to make a, a firm diagnosis. Next slide. So um, this uh, is uh, an image of a femoral angiogram as well as a CT angiogram showing fibromuscular dysplasia in the femoral arteries. Um, this was a uh, reported in 2012, uh, both by the Vancouver group and the Mayo group. We came at it a different, uh, completely different ways. Um, about half of those individuals um, in our series who had a femoral angiogram to look at had um, FMD. And so we started going looking for it. Next slide. And so depending on the series and the completeness of imaging, extracoronary arteriopathy of some type 
um, FMD um, is present in the majority FMD and over 50% and 70% have something. And that can include also dissection or aneurysm or pseudo aneurysm, dilation or tortuosity of the vessels and undulating aorta. So these are folks that um, implies that their vessels may have been vulnerable to dissection. Next slide. Um, so because of that, there is a recommendation. Um, one, good clinical history. Have they had any other aneurysms, family history of aneurysms or dissection? But we recommend a one-time arterial screen from brain to pelvis. Uh, we prefer, as do most, uh, CT um, angiography. Um, it's quicker, it's cheaper, and it's a, a bit more uh, higher resolution than MRI. Um, I think that it's important, though, that you don't um, that we don't tell patients or ourselves that the indication is to rule out FMD. We actually can't do that. It has limitations with all of the non-invasive imaging. They could have it in their arms and legs, and we've got some cases of that. The important part of this is that we are assuming that this patient likely has FMD since over 50% do. What we're looking for are dissections or aneurysms or other conditions that require close follow-up or perhaps treatment. This is less common that they have a brain aneurysm or something, but we have coiled a few aneurysms or had to treat surgically um, uh, some splenic artery aneurysms that started um, uh, growing. So important to do this. How much follow-up in a normal scan one would need? We, we haven't come to that yet. Next slide. Another association that got pulled forward by a lot of uh, case reports was an association with autoimmune conditions. So we were seeing a lot of SCAD patients who were getting this big workup for you know, rheumatoid factor and lupus and everything. And in fact, if you think about it, SCAD her, uh, occurs predominantly in women as do these autoimmune conditions. And so we, uh, and all of our um, registries have some biases in terms of referral. So, um, what we have found is that using a population base of the of Minnesota and Wisconsin, um, there was no difference, 11% versus 12% of those uh, with an autoimmune condition who had SCAD. So that's important. If they don't already have it, you don't need to go looking for it. Um, but we also saw an incidence of SCAD go up largely uh, around uh, increased recognition. Next slide. Another common association, and we'll talk a bit more, is pregnancy-associated SCAD. Most commonly occurs one week postpartum, but it can occur um, at any point and during pregnancy. Those individuals who have pregnancy-associated SCAD, it's more severe, more likely to present as STEMI with shock, left main or multivessel. They have a higher 30-day and three-year MACE and more likely to have left ventricular dysfunction. It's associated with multiparity, advanced maternal age, infertility, possibly preeclampsia. There's a signal there. Next slide. So generally, we advise folks who have had a SCAD not to get pregnant again, both because of the risk, the SCAD specific risk, as well as having um, had a myocardial infarction, because the SCAD risk can be present even if their prior SCAD was not pregnancy associated. Obviously, we know about the hemodynamic changes um, that occur during normal pregnancy. And so we recommend using an effective non-hormonal contraceptive, um, so a levonorgestrel IUD, especially if they have menorrhagia from the, uh, from the dual angioplatelet therapy we put them on, to be very helpful. We talk about preconception counseling. I like to have the partner there. Um, I have had there being a, 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 a sort of a, a disconnect with partners about the desire for children uh, versus assuming the risk. Obviously reviewing meds, um, ejection fraction, and if they get pregnant, you definitely need a multidisciplinary team and a vaginal delivery is generally preferred, uh, potentially assisted. Next slide. So what if I really wanna have a baby? Um, we can tell people if they say, I'm gonna get pregnant with your help or not. So. I think having the data so they can make those decisions. Um, when we have looked at those who have had a child after a SCAD, most women tolerate the pregnancy and lactation without an increased risk. But about 8 to 12% will have recurrent SCAD. So that's important for them to know. And the recurrent SCAD may not be more likely among women with pregnancy, but particularly if they already have children, the risk to that mother for her 
existing children is significant. And I think just having um, those tough discussions, they're much easier in the 45 year old who has completed her family than the 19 year old who does not have a boyfriend and has had planned to have children. So I think this is one of those things that we clearly need to know more about. And for whom we might be able to say pregnancy is reasonably safe and we're just not there yet. Next slide. Some of the other things we have to consider, we talked about uterine bleeding. Some of these folks have so much bleeding, they need uterine ablation. Managing menstrual uh, angina, FMD and associated conditions. Um, they may need to see a vascular specialist. Most people who treat a lot of patients with SCAD have, be ha have become FMD experts, uh, or at least for the minor stuff. Migraine management, we talked about that. There is a huge psychosocial burden uh, that includes anxiety, PTSD, and depression. Whether that burden is actually greater than um, age and gender matched individuals who have a myocardial infarction is difficult to say because we know that SCAD is the dominant form of myocardial infarction in these younger individuals. But it, there is a hypothesis that perhaps because of the lack of control of secondary prevention agents that it may even be more exacerbated. And then many of these individuals are suffering losses which include, you know, uh, Reproduct, loss of reproductive options or their health. Next slide. A brief note on SCAD in men. Um, uh, the CAN SCAD, which had a bigger cohort, um, uh, reported out in, in a research letter that, um, that confirmed about 10% of their SCADs um, were men, had very similar presentations and same CV risk factors. They tended to be a bit younger, very little bit younger. They were less likely to have migraines and FMD and more likely to have exercise as a trigger and less likely to have an emotional trigger. They had fewer chest pain readmissions, but if you look at them at the three year, one year and three years, they had similar uh, outpatient complications. Next slide. So in terms of long-term SCAD management, because that may be when you see them is, um, yes, physical activity. These folks need rehab. It is safe and effective and desirable to get them started within one to two weeks after their SCAD. Um, during COVID, some of these individuals waited months or were unable to get into a cardiac rehab and their mental health really uh, suffered. We do recommend that, so we recommend 30 to 40 minutes of, um, uh, of regular moderate intensity aerobic uh, uh, exercise, but avoid high intensity competitive sports endurance training, um, boot camps, especially in extreme temperatures. We do recommend strength training. Remember, these are women who, as they age, are going to have a fall risk. And so we want to make sure that they are strong and have good balance, but lower resistance and higher reps. And then limit lifting to avoid straining or prolonged Valsalva. So we don't get above weight limit because that can change over time. If I can only lift 20 pounds now, but I build up my muscles, I can lift 40 pounds maybe in a couple of years. Um, but we do talk about uh, and explain what a Valsalva is. And this is important because some individuals have work that they need to do that they're required to do, and that may be an impact. Um, uh, next click. Um, so we need to provide sort support for the patient and family. And then consider medical genetics referral. And I say that because you don't need to refer all these people. Um, but for those who, if you take a family history, they have that, they have any signs of connective tissue disorders, I think it's quite, um, it's quite uh, reasonable. Next. Now, I get asked a lot by these individuals um, who are very worried about family members. So first, um, familial FMD and familial SCAD are very rare. In our uh, registry of over 1,500, we've got about 12 or 13 families. Um, it, the pattern of inheritance implicates both recessive and dominant modes of inheritance. Um, this was a, a, a paper we published a few years ago. And we do know because we've done enough whole exome sequencing of our DNA samples that there is no SCAD gene. You cannot test for SCAD. Next slide. So we do have um, a, a about 1,200 uh, DNA samples, so it's one of the largest, um, and have been collaborating with a number of international consortiums, putting all of our, our samples together to try to um, learn more about this. Next slide. And one of the, um, next slide. 
one of the um, uh, the findings that was really interesting published uh, a couple of years ago is that there are several loci that if you turn on one allele, you have a higher risk for SCAD and maybe, and if you have the other, and you may also be protected from coronary artery disease and vice versa. So this was the first report of that um, sort of opposite effect um, or opposite relationship. And um, next slide. And just reported uh, at American Heart Association. And then, and again, this was uh, seven, so um, almost 2,000 SCAD patients with controls, almost, well, over 9,000 controls with eight different centers, England, France, Australia, Mount Sinai, University of Michigan, UCLA, Vancouver General, and Mayo. And so we identified 17 risk loci and 12 were new. And so it suggests that there clearly this is that SCAD is polygenic, has environmental factors, and it does have some of these genetics that are, are shared with aneurysm and dissection. Um, and we, in addition to the uh, factor one and EDNI that I showed in the prior slide, we found six additional, well, five additional um, loci that had directionally opposite effects. And one unique uh, um, tissue factor um, uh, three, which was novel because it had to do with tissue coagulation with kind of may have some mechanistic things to help us with for SCAD. So I would say on the genetic part, stay tuned. Um, this is not ready for prime time. We are not testing, but our goal is going to be that we get a polygenic risk score that can help individuals in the future with both inherited risk, but also to help um, with perhaps risk stratify. You know, say you have a less likely, uh, less likely to have recurrence, or I think it's safer you have a baby because right now we have no risk stratification in the SCAD population. Next slide. So just a little bit about our registry. So we now have enrolled over 1,500 individuals with confirmed SCAD. So every angiogram is overread and confirmed. Um, we get their imaging, medical records. We ask them a bunch of questionnaires, and these are both retrospective and prospective. We also ask them to give a personal SCAD narrative. So these are not necessarily patients who, um, who need to come to Mayo Clinic. And we needed that history, right, to link together the medical records. And that's been very helpful um, some people write a just, excuse me, just the facts, bulleted points. Others write five page single spaced about every feeling they were having. And we actually are looking to review those um, to better understand the experience of SCAD. So we also have some perspective clinical evaluations and follow up questionnaires. And we have a, a fairly high volume SCAD clinic that sees about 30 to 40 patients, uh, SCAD patients a month. Um, next slide. Here are some resources for you um, in terms of both our website, which has resources for clinicians as well as patients, as well as um, a PubMed. For your patients, um, we, we, Mayo Clinic has a Facebook page, but there's a SCAD survivors page that you can send them to um, where they can have a closed community. Um, and both SCAD Research Inc. and womenheart.org um, have resources for patients with SCAD and particularly for women with heart disease. Next slide. So to summarize, if you are not already, you will see more SCAD because of awareness, because of intravascular imaging, uh, perhaps because of increased um, uh, prevalence. We have to maintain our index of suspicion. So when that person comes in talking about their chest pain, um, even if they're young and female and have no cardiovascular risk, let's at least get a, a, a troponin and uh, two troponins if the first one's negative and an ECG. And because the correct diagnosis is more important because the management acutely and long-term um, is really different. Remember that these are patients we can't just send off and expect that they'll do well. The burden of recurrence and chest pain and MACE is very high. We need to screen for arteriopathies. Aim for normal blood pressure, less than 120 or over 80 throughout a lifetime because that is one of the goals with FMD and presumably uh, pre uh, prevents or lowers risk and shear stress and has been associated high blood pressure with uh, recurrence and referrals are welcome to our registry. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions and participate in the discussion.
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sharon. And uh, we'll bring back Rachna and Delphin. First of all, I must say that uh, we did it. We did this uh, despite all the odds. And I'm going to share with the <laughs> audience what the odds were. So just five minutes before we jumped into the um, meeting, so there was a blackout. So in RWJ, there was a total blackout. So we started scrambling for finding power outlets to be able to log into our computers because there was none of the computers working. So we found the computers. And then we had this uh, uh, unprecedented challenges also that came up with uh, trying to get the slides in time and also the Zoom to work in time. So, and almost everybody, <laughs> but despite all the odds, we had a spectacular uh, grand rounds. We really enjoyed. So thank you very much, Sharon. And I, I, while I'm, we are celebrating uh, all the, this beautiful woman here, I want to also highlight uh, Dr. Navina Yanmala, who's been working behind the back. You can see her picture up there. She really helped us to bring this whole thing together. So thank you, Navina, for all the hard work behind to make this happen within 10 minutes. So this is incredible. So now that we are celebrating uh, a moment of uh, uh, a great uh, achievement uh, in terms of getting this through to the crowds, and I'm sure the crowds, uh, our, our people loved it hearing, I'm going to turn back to some of the more um, intrinsic questions. First to Sharon, and then we can go to each one of you. Um, biases. When you develop this kind of a literature, it's not easy because you're against odds uh, in every form. Um, tell us about what have you seen, not just in Mayo Clinic, but outside. What are, the, what are the prevailing biases that are actually preventing women from getting the kind of support, particularly chest pain in women is yeah. probably undertreated. And there, it's, very, it's a very difficult topic, requires us specialized group of people to look into it. How do we get there? You know, I, one thing I will say is because I've been in this, you know, heart disease and women advocacy for, you know, more than two decades and early on, you know, I, I, you know, I think we saw a decade of 15 years or so where, yes, I was, it was very gratifying. Women would come sit down in my office um, with a positive stress. As they said, I thought it was just menopause or I thought it was just heart was just indigestion. My doctor did a stress test and that's why I'm here. Or, you know, I wasn't thinking. So, so things had imp have improved a lot, but I think where we've hit a wall is really in these younger patients that we, all of us, because of our unconscious biases about what a heart, dis heart attack person looks like. And we ha it has become part of the culture and it's part of the culture of our patients too. So they're not thinking about heart. If you think about the breast cancer community and how, wildly successful that they have they have been in terms of prompting women to take seriously breast cancer you know breast cancer kills about 40,000 women every year a, a staggering number but heart disease kills about 500,000 women so it's it, it, it the we need to do as well as a specialty and society needs to help us understand that and it starts with the paramedics, I have had patients in the middle of uh, young patients called 911, they checked them out. They said, oh, your ECG doesn't look that bad. Are you sure you wanna go to the hospital? Now, if a profession, health professional asked me a question like that, that could be very intimidating. So it's not just our cardiologists. We need to change the system and believe women. Rachna? Uh, Sharon, amazing talk, always have been a fan of your work, and it, it takes a lot of courage, it takes a lot of grit and determination to look at SCAD and then do what you did. So amazing job. Uh, just a couple questions. Uh, where would you put the role of MRI in the diagnosis of SCAD? Um, so great question. So I think I think the role of MRI is um, is growing. Actually, there's not a lot of data to guide us, and a lot of the data was observational. So there was a nice study that came out of Leicester, England, where they looked at MRIs in, in a large number, but a lot of them were normal, and they were done months, even a year afterwards. So I think that's a, a challenge. Um, where I find um, cardiac MRI the most helpful is 
the patient who comes in with a troponin elevation and chest pain, and we don't really see anything on their angiogram. And so the differential, particularly during COVID, was myocarditis versus maybe a very small vessel scat or something that healed. And I think that the difference in MRI, it's going to help us and may even prompt us to go back and look at possible SCAD. I think it can help us from a, a, a research standpoint um, as well. Um, at least it's suggesting a lot of these SCADs are very small heart attacks. Like they, some of them don't even have wall motion abnormalities acutely or they on echo and they improve completely um, within days before hospital dismissal. That's good news for the patient, right? Um, that, you know, I've got patients who've had four or five SCADs and they have normal EF and maybe minor wall motion abnormalities. I think MRI um, has helped us make the diagnosis of multivessel SCAD because they had an inexplicable two areas that were not contiguous. Um, and then we went back and looked at the angiogram and said, oh yeah, now I see it. Um, it can be very helpful. I think it's mainly gonna be helpful acutely within the first seven to 10 days. And so if you're unsure, that is your window of opportunity to use an MRI to clarify the diagnosis. That's great. Thank you. May I have one more question, Parker? Sure. Uh, you had said that uh, avoid straining uh, and in any strength training exercise for women with scat uh, and bearing down. But then uh, one of the comments that was made is vaginal delivery is preferred for women who have had scat. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, that's a great question. So vaginal delivery, it may be that it's a high forceps assisted delivery um, wow. with that. So, to, uh, so we do recommend avoiding prolonged um, labor, but um, we kind of follow the guide of our um, maternal fetal uh, group. And even really the sickest adult congenital patients, we recommend a vaginal delivery, right? Because um, the risk of surgery, the variations in, um, in blood pressure, and there's no evidence that not pushing. So we have had seen SCADs after planned C-sections, no labor. Early on, you know, a decade ago when we were seeing, I thought, oh, it must be that they're pushing so hard for so long. But in fact, it is probably much more the hormonal fluxes that occur around delivery because that the most of them occur in that first week. So if you can get them through um, doing a, a labor with, with an abbreviated pushing, um, uh, perhaps with assistance, even forceps suction is generally what is recommended, but obviously every woman is different. Thank you. Great, uh, Delphine, so you are an interventional cardiologist. So what do you experience and do you have any questions for Sharon? Uh, thank you, Sharon, for a beautiful talk. It was very informational, informative for me, um, and definitely for myself. Um, I think that as a female interventional cardiologist, um, it is uh, surprising how many women uh, actually get turned away because their symptoms are definitely not typical a lot of the times. Um, even I've had patients that were in their 40s with normal EKGs, normal troponins, but the story was so good. And I took them and they definitely had something. And it was very easy just to say no because everything else was normal. Um, but it, it's very important to take a very good history and understand where the person is coming from, um, what they're doing every day and how their life has changed based on their symptoms. And we really just need to listen to our patients. Um, I, com I completely agree with you. And I, I think one of the things that you hit upon was we need to believe women. And we also have to have, you know, I've been around for a long time in cardiology and have developed a huge amount of humility. When I think back 20 years ago, when I told patients, women often, who had a positive stress test or exertional chest pain, and then they had normal coronaries. And I said, good news, it's not your heart. And I know a large proportion of those probably had microvascular dysfunction um, because we have not studied heart disease in women. And so we cannot, if we are honest with ourselves, confidently tell women it isn't just because X isn't true or this test didn't test. I don't feel very confident. Um, uh, I can rule out the serious stuff, but I have to keep an, an open, you know, an open mind because this science is really evolving. I mean, 
You know, we told people who had Minoka they didn't have a heart attack, even though they had elevated troponins. We, we need to learn more and then apply it. I, I can't agree with you more, Sharon. I, over the years, over the last 20 years, it, I have evolved as a cardiologist just because I, I don't write off. Uh, if the three major coronaries don't show anything, I'm not going to tell them you don't have anything. Microvascular right. angina, Inoka, Minoka, these are real things. And so is scared. So thank you for doing what you did. And, and I can very confidently say that um, there is a there is a lot that we need to do here in the community in New Jersey. We certainly have a, a huge burden of population, women population who come to the ED with chest pain. And perhaps uh, we need to develop uh, new pathways. Uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, everybody's hard pressed and history taking has, has been become an art uh, that is not well done most of the time. So we need to enforce uh, time being spent more with the patient than you spend on the electronic medical record. Unfortunately, that's also a, like a, you know, <laughs> whatever we can do to bring people back to the patients, that's going to be useful. Any form of innovation so that they are really having that inquiry and that feeling of inquisitiveness. And, and we have to serve the reason the patient is here, right? Not the medical record or the troponins. Um, anyway, so... Uh, I think it's uh, almost uh, 6 50, 20 minutes past uh, our time. Uh, and we had a significant presence of people, and most of them stayed to the very end. So thank you very much. Uh, we potentially should do this again next year or in the coming with some other topics, Sharon. We are a big fan of uh, your work that you've done and all the work that you do with the national societies. And, uh, and, and there's a lot to learn and share. And, uh, and I think creating this, uh, we didn't even discuss about creating the uh, environment and a culture of inclusiveness, diversity, um, respect, uh, and civility uh, in workplace, which is equally important because that will allow all of these themes to come together, uh, which is very important. And we stand by spirit. Uh, we stand committed. I stand committed. My people stand committed. So we look forward to collaborating with all of you and taking this journey ahead. Thank you very much and good night. Good night. Thank you.